okay, so looking looks like we've got um, a reasonable number of attendees now. So I'll start with the introduction. Yeah. Okay, so today, uh, welcome to um, this Institution of Mechanical Engineers um, Knowledge Transfer Lecture. Um, and the subject matter is power pods, which is the uh, development of the first modular battery system um, with, with quick change capability for the use in a motorcycle platform. Our speaker is uh, Christopher Ratcliffe, who's the director of Brace Technology based in the Northwest. Um, Chris um, previously was the, uh, between 2010 and 2019, was the chief designer at CCM Motorcycles, um, who recently introduced models such as the Spitfire. Um, and Christa Christopher has also recently founded uh, Langham Motorcycles, which should be the platform for this, for this new technology development. So without further ado, I'll hand you over to uh, Christopher for the uh, for the talk. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mark. Uh, thanks, uh, thanks everybody for attending. Uh, okay, I'm going to take you on a journey for the next 45 minutes of the last two years uh, of Brace Technology and our our work in the EV sector uh, with power pods and our new modular battery system. I'll just give you a little quick, uh, brief overview of my background. So I started out uh, as a, an automotive engineer qualified uh, in 2006 and went into the oil and gas industry, first of all, because it was quite difficult uh, up in the Northwest at that time to find a suitable automotive position. Uh, spent four years in the oil and gas on heavy machinery, uh, working on some exciting technology offshore, uh, but I was always on the lookout for an automotive uh, position. I was lucky enough in 2010 to join CCM uh, for what was my dream job. Uh, eventually ended up as the chief design engineer there and introduced the GP450 adventure bike, which is uh, a ground brake and lightweight adventure bike. And then more recently, uh, as Mark mentioned, the, the Spitfire range. Uh, but it was always a sort of desire to launch a new motorcycle brand uh, from the ground up and also uh, work on some some cutting edge innovations and get into the EV sector. So I thought the best way to do this is to start from the beginning. Uh, so two years ago, I launched Brace Technology uh, and we work on a lot of sort of subcontract engineering and design uh, work for people, but also develop our own uh, EV technology. So. We do also develop the Langer Motorcycles brand uh, with this, this our first debut motorcycle, the, the Langer Two Stroke, and uh, it's got a novel two stroke engine using fuel injection and ECU controlled uh, uh, oil injection. And this is all about brand building and making some interesting high quality lightweight motorcycles. And alongside this, we're developing our own EV technology uh, and our own battery technology. We're developing partnerships within the industry and our own knowledge and skills and products ourselves. And eventually when the time is right, uh, and motorcyclists catch up with the rest of the world in adopting EV motorcycles, then the two technologies will merge and we'll create a, an EV motorcycle on, under the Langham brand. So the PowerPoint concept, uh, it, first came, <laughs> it first came to fruition really uh, in a pub, uh, speaking to a, good friend who is a uh, doctor in motor design uh, and power electronics and is also a motorcyclist and, and we were really discussing uh, how how we could help motorcyclists adopt EV technology and what sort of barriers and challenges there were to to adopting EV technology in motorcycles and we we came up with the modular battery uh, system which uh, is configurable it's portable uh, and you basically can have multiple pods within a vehicle, uh, giving aesthetic advantages, dynamic and ergonomic advantages to what's currently out there and solving some of the problems and the challenges that we have at the moment. So uh, hex design allows us to integrate uh, into the negative space in a motorcycle to really compact uh, everything as tightly as possible so we can connect pods together at 60 degree angles rather than 90 degree angles like a box or uh, a, a rectangular package. Uh, we have a, a number of unique features within the pod, which we'll go into a little bit more detail, uh, such as the BMS, which offers cascading 
discharge across the pods. So it simulates a conventional fuel tank where we drain the top one, then the second one, then the third one. And that gives us the ability to be able to top up the system by quickly and instantly just changing the pod out. Uh, and this sort of, we thought, can tackle the range anxiety uh, where shorter journeys are needed, uh, less pods can be used and things like that. So the basic specs of the pods that we have today is 100 volts, uh, which is around the safe voltage for industrial, industrial equipment, such as forklift trucks. Uh, we've got uh, an 18 kilowatt, 18 amp power capacity, uh, and we're very energy and power dense because uh, some of the unique features of the pod allow us to uh, leave out some uh, features such as active cooling, complicated active cooling and onboard charging. Because we have the ability to leave the pod at the place of work or home, then uh, we can uh, create a really dense energy pod uh, with as many cells in there as, as possible. So just a few of the features, uh, an overview really of the of uh, what the pods are capable of. So first of all, the modular. So uh, you can run a vehicle or some equipment off one pod, two pods, or ten pods. Uh, and you know this offers advantages for manufacturing, uh, modularity, and for companies who want to integrate EV into their range, but don't necessarily want to start from a, a, a new platform uh, and, and overcome all of the initial development costs uh, that that entails. Uh, so we have a cascading discharge, which is one of the, the greatest features. So uh, the top the top pod or any pod can deplete, uh, and when that gets to its lower state of charge, around 20%, then it uh, automatically switches over to the next pod. So that gives us a scenario whereby we can uh, remove one pod and uh, quickly top it up from a pod that's at home or a place of work uh, or in a support vehicle or even in a fleet vehicle scenario, uh, siphoning between two vehicles and, and uh, swapping pods between the two to give an instant top up uh, with, uh, you know, without any tools. Uh, there's a high energy density due to the uh, no need for an onboard charger and, and liquid cooling and and, and power sharing. So I guess the best the best analogy, and this is probably because the idea was born uh, over a pint, but uh, we put this analogy to uh, some investors and managed to get some grant funding off the back of it to develop the technology. So if you can imagine going to uh, a, a summer's barbecue and trying to plan how much uh, your favourite beverage that you was to drink that day, uh, what you didn't want to do really is take a large barrel uh, and either half fill it or fill it to the top or fill it 10% and carry that large barrel around with you. And that's essentially what people are doing now, having one solution, one battery for all use case scenarios. So what we thought, well, wouldn't it be great if there was a, uh, a solution which enabled you to carry, say, six smaller cartridges of that beverage uh, and uh, be able to store some in a, in a docking scenario or a refrigerator and use exactly and carry exactly the amount that you will need for that use case in that day uh, and send so that riding scenario or driving scenario in that journey time. Uh, and then they have the ability if you come into an emergency situation where your stock uh, of that beverage is, is totally depleted, then you can power share and you can you can swap pods between uh, each other. So that's sort of, sort of the concept. Uh, so uh, one unique feature we've built into the pods uh, is off-board use. So when, when the pod is not docked inside the vehicle, uh, it can be docked in an off-board charger and run different voltages from the top. So we can have a USB output or 36 volt out output uh, and run different equipment. So in, uh, in, in off-grid scenarios, uh, we can run laptops, we can run refrigeration units, medical units, uh, lighting and things like that. Yeah, but the greatest, really the greatest advantage is not only for the consumer, but for vehicle uh, integrators, uh, is the configurable power range, weight and cost, giving different points of entry for the customer and uh, the vehicle integrator using the same common platform and gaining the benefit of the modularity and so sort of mass volume uh, economics. So here's just an overview of some of the uh, power pod applications that we that we've identified, and uh, we've been speaking to some companies uh, since we created the first 
prototypes and been demonstrating the first prototypes. We've had we've been approached by uh, automotive companies from all different sectors, not just motorcycles, for different variations and shapes of the pods. So motorcycle trail riding, where uh, the environmental uh, pressures are increasing, so you know the, the noise on tailpipe emissions are important, and this is one of the the early adopter areas in the motorcycle industry at the moment. Uh, that picture isn't me, but it's a it's a familiar sight from my trail riding. So you know durability uh, is a key aspect with the pods that we're working to get right. Uh, UTVs and ATVs, much the same as motorcycles. Off-grid applications, so also in leisure vehicles uh, as an auxiliary power supply. Uh, farming, again, we're in environmental challenges. So there's a there's a movement at the moment to bring more EVs into the farming sector where short, short journey times, going back to the same base is needed. So again, power pods uh, really have a lot of benefits in that area. So military and defense, uh, you know, we, we've got a good communication over the last couple of years with the DSTL and the MOD. Uh, in fact, we, we demonstrated the pods uh, in a motorcycle to the MOD only last week. Uh, we're in constant communication to see if there's something that they might want to adopt in, in the future. Autonomous vehicles, again, in a campus scenario where uh, you want to reduce the weight of the, of the autonomous vehicle and you're running around a short range uh, and uh, you can use the power pods to uh, in a fleet scenario where you can swap the pods or, and have one large bank of char pods charging all the time and be able to to go to that point uh, and, and top up. And similar in, in the marine section uh, where e EVs are becoming a little bit more prevalent. So some of the major challenges we identified at the moment in terms of the motorcycle and power pods. So uh, first of all, uh, the electrically safe, quick removal of the pods it was absolutely key that when a pod is not just on the vehicle, but when we remove it quickly, the challenge is to be able to seal up all the connectors, uh, prevent any rider from being out or users to be able to touch any connections, uh, very dangerous voltages, environmental challenges with the dock and, and the pod itself. So full environmental protection when docked and undocked. And then maximizing the vehicle capacity uh, and using those negative spaces on, on the vehicle. Uh, in a motorcycle, the uh, a battery accounts for a good proportion, around 30% of the whole vehicle weight. So it's really critical to uh, to position that weight in, in the correct place to optimise rider ergonomics. Uh, and the vehicle dynamics, so, you know, we, as Brace uh, and Langan, uh, we're very critical about the vehicle performance, uh, the attributes, uh, keeping the centre of gravity in the right place, the weight distribution to, I mean, we're running around 53% at the front and around 47% at the rear. Uh, and then also the motor specifications and the physical dimensions and all the other attributes that go with the motor and the integration into the chassis. So from the outset, we looked at uh, some of the the competitors in the, in the market are some of the bikes that have been most widely adopted. So on one end, end of the spectrum is the KTM Freeriding. Um, that's a lightweight, great bike, low range, uh, 3.9 kilowatt hours, 18 kilowatt, and only 110 kilograms. It's designed for very short journeys off road, uh, and you know it runs for around an hour, and then it needs to be charged up for for several hours before uh, it can be used again. So uh, the power pods. Give a great advantage there so we can run from one on one power pod and save another 10 kilograms or we could run on two power pods and top up the system depending on what that rider wanted to do and if you're using it in a, a trail around environment where you've got a support vehicle or a van then you can have pods on charge ready to be swapped uh, right there after after half an hour or one hour of riding and then on the other side of the market uh, which we can't ignore is zero motorcycles and these are sort of the, the founding fathers of the motorcycle EV industry at the moment, and I think they still still sell more than all the competitors combined uh, in, in the EV motorcycle world at the moment. So they offer a motorcycle which is, is very heavy, it's 187 kilogram. It's got good capacity on there, but again, you are you are carrying this capacity for every journey, uh, even when it isn't needed. So you know we the power pods give the ability for the vehicle integrator to uh, the vehicle manufacturer to run with one or two pods, uh, thus reducing the cost. Uh, giving an accessible entry level to the customer, 
and then having the ability to top up the system or add to the system at a later date as a, an optional accessory uh, for different kinds of journeys. Uh, and in a commuting scenario where we can leave a pod at home or the workplace on, on slow charge, uh, then you know, we really uh, reduce the weight on the motorcycle uh, and, and uh, help, help people to uh, adopt EV bikes sooner. So, so starting out, we, we needed to ensure that we could create a motorcycle that was within the right specifications to uh, an IC equivalent at the moment. So we did some mathematical calculations, uh, first of all, uh, based on, on a standard power pod to, to those uh, specifications. And we came up with a list of target motorcycle characteristics that mathematically we thought were, were achievable. So some acceleration times, the top speed, uh, prone and upright. So we'll, we'll go into a little bit more about the effect of, of that in a moment. Uh, and the frontal area and the weights, the curb weight of 132 kilogram. I mean, we have just recently uh, built our second version of the prototype and it's 130 kilograms. So we're, we're bang on target with that, thankfully. And in the power range, we're looking around the 250cc motorcycle range, which is the most common for trail riding and uh, lots of applications. So this gives us, in total, with using four pods uh, at 7.5 kilowatt hour total, uh, around 40 to 45 kilogram of pods, and an indicative four hours reconnaissance riding or uh, uh, riding uh, in, in built up areas, and one and a half hours aggressive tactical riding uh, in, in total. So this, this would all be fine tuned through th further simulations. So we decided to then uh, create some uh, digital uh, kinematic studies uh, to verify our, our mathematical assumptions. And so we use the World Manufacturers Test Cycles uh, that comes in three phases and is bursts of 10 minute intervals of different differing speeds and throttle responses. Uh, WMTC1 is based around sort of town and commuting use with a sort of 20 kilometer hour uh, average in total. WMTC2 is slightly higher, faster A roads, uh, the equivalent, and WMTC3 is basically full throttle everywhere, uh, racing or sort of motorway speeds. So we decided that WMTC phase three was not a scenario that this bike was, was targeted at, at all. Uh, in fact, it's from our initial calculations, it could barely pull those those uh, speeds. Uh, anyway, it's a 250cc motorcycle. So we we decided to adopt uh, WMC TC1 and 2 together as a 20 minute cycle and use those as our test base for the simulations. So before we get started on the simulations, uh, just would like to clear up the prone and upright positions, which you'll see on the next slides. Upright is as, as you would expect, uh, sat upright uh, in a comfortable position for commuting, and you, know, you have a large, large frontal area. Prone, you see Valentino Rossi there, took behind the screen, and really reducing his uh, drag coefficient there. Now we, uh, from the frontal area calculations and and the CD calculations, you can see there's a there's perhaps a twenty percent uh, difference between them both. Now, given that uh, in in the mathematics. Uh, as velocity increases, uh, the the resistance uh, increases by square root of the velocity, so it really does have an impact the faster you go. So we we plotted the prone and upright uh, for both scenarios. So in in this graph here, you can see we've done uh, an energy use through one complete cycle, so one thousand two hundred seconds. Uh, you can see the first half of the graph is the speeds from WMTC1, the second half from WMTC2. And down below you can see the power usage over that single cycle of a phase is 0.56 kilowatt hours for the upright and 0.423 for uh, the prone position. So already we're seeing a bit of a difference now. In what we noticed after analyzing a lot of competitors claims for their systems and running through their numbers in our calculations and simulations, most manufacturers claim the, uh, 
the prone position, the, the best case scenario for everything. So, but what we want to know is 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 the actual real world uh, results that we're going to get, and some marketable results possibly as well. In terms of performance predictions, uh, utilizing the four pods, we, we ran these uh, through the kinematic study. And uh, again, you can see uh, the blue line is for the prone position tucked in and the uh, red line is for the upright position. And what we wanted to do was continue to run those cycles. So you can just see in the background, the gray lines, we ran both cycles over and over again until we the whole system ran to a 20 percent state of charge. So this is to protect the cells from uh, getting uh, too low in, the, in a state of charge. Again, we noticed some other manufacturers uh, take this result to zero to get the claimed figures. So that was interesting, but you can already see uh, for the full system, uh, 100 kilometers for upright and 154 kilometers for prone position. Uh, so that's the effect on a motorcycle that the uh, drag coefficient really has. And in terms of the overall performance and the maximum speed and acceleration, uh, to verify those, we, we again ran the kinematic studies and uh, you can see in the uh, at the beginning they they're very consistent uh, again but as as the velocity increases uh, again the drag coefficient uh, increases as well so you can see the difference there we're running up to about 145 kilometers per hour theoretically uh, tucked in and around 120 or so uh, in an upright position so this really validated our our mathematical calculations uh, and we hit all of our targets or thereabouts so in terms of uh, uh, the speeds and the performance we were getting around uh, the correct figures 125 145 and then the accelerations again we were uh, we were there thereabouts with all of our all of our uh, predictions and this these really fall in line uh, in fact they're a little bit better due to the, the instant torque of, of the electrical motor uh, so they, they compared very well to a 250cc uh, off-road motorcycle uh, that, that are currently in the marketplace. So the next challenge was really to, to look at the, the pod itself and its layouts. Now, my background isn't power electronic, so I leaned heavily on, on, on Tirius, uh, who, who we partnered with on, uh, on this project for, for the electrical system. And we really, uh, what I learned was it's not as simple as packing a shape with as many cells as you can. So we we went through lots and lots of iterations uh, of cells within the bike of pod sizes. So we changed the pod length, the pod hexagon diameter across across the flats. Uh, and this was, this took a matter of months really to to find configurations of cells that we could we could have to get the correct voltage and the right current out uh, and the right power. And also housing a number of other components, contactors, mechanical interlocks, BMS boards, and other components uh, such as that, and, and buzz bars to connect them all. So eventually we came up with this shape. We had to leave the, the cutout in the top left for all of the components. And uh, what we had was four layers of 18650 cells, uh, all connected together. And it's basically 28 series uh, and six parallel, giving a total 1.8 kilowatt hours theoretical capacity uh, to a zero set of charge. We started out with 18650 cells because they are, they are easy to get hold of. They are uh, very reliable uh, and very predictable. So we use these for the simulations on, on the first prototypes. The great thing is about the power pods is they're not cell specific. So we're already looking at 21700 cells for, for a different scenario and a larger battery pack for uh, another automotive supply. Uh, and we're also looking at pouch cells the great thing about pouch cells is we can uh, we can stack them like slices in a loaf of bread and really create iterative uh, power in in the pod whilst reducing the length uh, iteratively rather than every sixty or seventy millimeters like we've got at the moment to get our correct power requirements. The eighteen six fifties are a great place to start. Uh, having so we. We purchased a lot at the beginning of 2019, uh, and three months later, the price doubled. So uh, it would have been nice to uh, order several hundred thousand of those at the time. 
So once we had a motorcycle kinematics and our performance targets verified, we we needed to be sure that our assumptions on on our thermal analysis uh, uh, were correct. Also, so we we are working on the assumption that we do not need any active cooling, uh, any liquid cooling. So we we employed a company uh, up in the northwest called AJ Powertrain, and we conducted some thermal thermal analysis to check there were going to be. And no thermal problems in different states of loading or, or fires, as, as I refer to them. Uh, so what we did, we, we modelled one layer of, of cells within the pod, and we modelled the negative space between them. Uh, so created these cylinders as they create a nice, uh, simple uh, simulation method uh, and calculations for the programme. And through simulation, through GT suites, uh, we created a digital load bank. Uh, we're going from one, uh, from zero to fifteen kilowatts at one kilowatt resolutions, uh, and we we loaded the the cells. So we gave constant load discharge at each of those profiles and assessed the thermal capacity and the thermal performance uh, at each one of those intervals. And we had digital thermal imaging uh, around different hotspots uh, to check for hotspots. And we logged all the electrical parameters and temperatures. And the table below, you can see the findings from that. So, in the top line, we have the the one and two phases uh, that we talked about, uh, utilizing four pods joined together. So we're we're loading, we're not loading one pod. We're taking it from the four pods together, and we can see there's no state of charge limit reach, so the pods don't deplete, uh, and the cell temperatures remain relatively low, just above ambient. Uh, when we run those phases on one single pod, which is the main use case and flexibility of the power pods, again, we're, we're getting a, a temperature range at different points from 31 to 59 degrees. Again, that, that is under uh, our, uh, our specified uh, upper limit. Uh, but in WMTC3, as we suspected on, on one uh, pod, we did get problems. There would be uh, some serious issues with uh, thermal uh, activity. And with four pods, we were actually capable of using four pods in emergency situations. So full throttle, uh, maximum power from the motor. We have the ability to connect all four pods together, either automatically uh, or manually from, from the user and uh, be able to to cope with emergency situations uh, with the vehicle, high load situations. So after the simulation uh, testing, we decided to 3D print all of the first draft components uh, and make the first prototype cell uh, and, and pod. So we, we rigged up a physical load bank and we continued the same tests uh, on the physical part. And we were seeing uh, much the same results as the simulation. Uh, and we we bought an off-the-shelf uh, charging unit and was running different charge rates for that as well, just to verify uh, our simulation results. So you can see here, we were using constant four kilowatt load uh, most of the time, because that is our continuous power that the motor's rated at in this bike. And we actually noticed a few hotspots. Some of the hotspots on those images on the right hand side there are actually surface reflections. So they're giving a, a negative result. Uh, we found uh, a bit of an anomaly. But we decided whilst we were embarking on this uh, thermal testing to test out some passive heating. So we created what we call the toast rack. Uh, and it's basically aluminium heat sink plates between each layer of the cells. So we we have three in the middle, and uh, one on either end, so five, five plates which connect to a common plate, which then connect to the end outer handle. So uh, we are dissipating as much heat as we can. Now, from this first prototype, uh, we were seeing around five degree uh, difference, uh, but overall about a ten percent difference uh, and drop in temperature uh, from the first prototype. And there are there are more modifications that we can make, and we have made since then to further improve that as well. We can see here from the thermal testing. So the upper graph shows case one. This is without the toast rack or the heat sink, the passive cooling. Uh, you can see we're reaching around 70 degrees uh, in peak on that load. And each line represents a different thermocouple within the pod. So we have uh, 
seven thermocouples per layer. Uh, so we have a total of 28 thermocouples across the whole pod. So we're really monitoring as many places as we, as we can, in different, different areas uh, throughout the pod. And you can see in the table below, we've, we've dropped it by, by almost 10%, uh, the total temperature uh, within the pod. And it cools off much quicker as well. So this gives the ability, once we either charge, charge the pod very quickly or discharge it very quickly, uh, the pod cools a lot quicker. Uh, so we're able to put it up to full cycle once again. And you can see the, the heat from the orange line down at the bottom that is being absorbed uh, by the, the heating elements in the torch rack itself. So this is some, some further work for us to develop a bit further, which sort of improves the use case for but once we start to make larger pods for different scenarios, then we can include this uh, passive cooling uh, in those as well to really get some improvements on the amount of load we can give each pod. So this is the pod as it stands today. Uh, these handles you can see are connected to the heat sinks. Uh, they get relatively warm, 20, 30 degrees, but will never get up to a, a temperature that you can't comfortably hold it. And on, on the top right, you can see the base of the pod. So we wanted to use uh, some off the shelf connectors and in the first scenario we did, but the packaging of this pod is so tight that we, we went and designed uh, our own versions of high voltage and low voltage connections, including a mechanical interlock and a, 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 an electrical interlock. So the upper hole you can see on the top right hand side is the low voltage connections. So we're taking a CAN uh, output from the pod and we've got some low uh, low voltage 12 volt signals for various equipment as well. This has uh, a step within it, so uh, a few millimeters of a step. Step. So as soon as the dock uh, exits, the pod exits the dock by a couple of millimeters, there is no power can be drawn from the system. There's an, ele uh, an electrical shut off at that point. The next two connectors are the high voltage, the positive negative, and then the lower one is a recess for a slam lock so the pod is pushed into place and automatically locks uh, on a key lock in, into the dock on the vehicle and can be released just with a turn of a key and pulled off and also what you can't see inside there is a plunger and the plunger is connected to a rod that goes through the center of the pod and this is another failsafe mechanical interlock and something quite novel for our battery uh, and again this this activates a high voltage connection so if that is not fully depressed, then it's, again, it is impossible. Even if there's an electrical connection, it's impossible to take any power from the pod. So just a brief look at the, uh, the electrical architecture of the pod. So we have four pods. Each one of them is self-managed. So there are, there are four mini BMSs controlling each of the four layers that we saw and an overall BMS, which enables it to talk to the docking unit and, and other pods and control its, its own state of charge. And these talk to the pod and the vehicle control unit. So there's a CAN line coming out talking to the VCU and the low voltage supplies. And these will, uh, the VCU will control when, when one pod uh, tells the VCU that it is fully depleted, the VCU will then tell the other pod for the next pod in line to activate. Uh, and then we have both. Uh, each pod has then two high voltage connectors going to the HV supply uh, inverter and back into the motor. So during the beginning of the project, we, uh, we did a lot of work on the vehicle integration uh and the best way to package everything into the donor vehicle that we had at the time and the only way we could do this really was to create our own motor uh, so we you can see the cooling things on the uh integrate into all the negative space again to the motor to maximize the cooling on there and uh, we've got quite a novel motor that's been optimized uh to be a direct drive so we're not utilizing any gearboxes we're trying to simplify the whole part count of the vehicle uh, and, and uh, the number, number of electrical components on there as well. So the motor sits on the swing arm pivot coaxially to the swing arm pivot. Now this means uh, in an off-road scenario, usually we you have around 20 or 30 millimeters of chain stretch over a, a 300 mil of wheel travel, which greatly reduces the uh, life on the chain. So the great thing with sitting concentrically on the swing arm pivot is we don't have any train, chain stretch at all. Uh, and also enables us to push the motor further back in the vehicle uh, and distribute some of the weight back where we need it uh, and fit more battery capacity into the chassis. 
So the first iteration of the docking unit was a single lightweight docking panel. And this was created through creating carbon fiber sheets uh, that have been water jet and creating these large buzz bars inside that you can see uh, from copper. And that is again sandwiched and bonded to the carbon fiber. Now carbon fiber is conducted obviously, so we, we have uh, insulating layers in, in there also. Uh, and we use, you can see the red parts on the right hand picture, they are off the shelf quick connectors that we, we use to prove out the, uh, to prove out the project. And we run a thousand volts through here and uh, everything is it was electrically safe but it enabled us to really prove out the system and the way the pods communicate with each other so this was the first prototype vehicle uh, the bike was kindly donated from ccl motorcycles uh, and we, we basically cut the chassis in half and added the front section on and integrated the motor and first off pods into there so all the pods you see there are 3d printed uh, but they have the correct power electronics inside. So this enabled us to really to get a running vehicle pretty quickly uh, and start to be begin to test all of the functions of the pods, the interconnectivity, the cascading discharge, uh, and, until we could move on to the next the next iteration of the design. Something that we found uh, and quickly realised was the modularity of the pods was fantastic. Uh, the feedback we were getting from other companies that were showing the concept to was great. But the the limiting factor was the, the docking panel. Uh, it was something that had to be integrated to each vehicle and created for each vehicle. So we set out to design a flexible power dock module, uh, which could be uh, connected and built in arrays in the same way as the pods could so that vehicle adapters could, could quickly uh, and easily integrate these pods in, into any space uh, from a, a common building platform. Uh, so you can see here at the base of the dock on the left hand side there are some buzz bars which enable power to be taken out from all six faces uh, so they can be arranged in, in any way and these have low voltage and high voltage connections. And during this time, we also took the opportunity to develop our, our new version of the high voltage and low voltage connection strategy that you, you can see on the new pods. So now we had a new pod, uh, a new pod and dock design, we decided to create a second version vehicle, which was specifically built for these designs uh, and could be integrated best because there are other aspects of the vehicle, such as the inverter and all the power electronics also need to be taken in consider into consideration. So we decided to take some donor components from the KTM 250, we took the suspension, the wheels, and we developed the rest of the vehicle uh, based on the best ergonomics and the weight distribution and the vehicle dynamics and, and properties that we could. So some of the challenges we had with this was the uh, the motor does not have liquid cooling, uh, so and it's protected uh, from the wind or any air cooling from the battery. So we created this bash guard that gives dual airflow. So the faster you go, the more cooling we get to the top and the bottom of of the motor. So this is in test currently, uh, and we're getting good results uh, from the temperature measurements. Another important aspect for the whole bike was to minimize the number of connections and make it a simple and safe motorcycle, uh, minimize the number of wires around there. So all of the electrical components, all the power, train, uh, power electronic components, such as the inverter, the contactors, the vehicle control units, the low voltage supply, is all packaged in one space where the fuel tank would, not, would ordinarily be. And this keeps it as close as possible also to the batteries. So we're, we're running hard connection points through a little chimney from the top dock, which you can see at the bottom right, is, is uh, connected through bus bars up, up into the, uh, the access panel uh, and the electrical box up at the top. And again, so as, as the top power pod is removed uh, and depleted, uh, the, the voltage runs through the docks, through the bottom docks, through the top box and straight into the, uh, straight into the electrical box. So this here is, is a second prototype uh, and this this photo was taken around two or three weeks ago uh, and this is our next mule vehicle that we are beginning uh, to test. There's no motor in this picture, it's actually uh, got the motor in now and we're building the power electronics into there and within the next two to three weeks we'll have this uh, on test, testing the new docking system and more functionality of the pods. And these have come off production tooling. So the 
the docking unit uh, now has aluminium extrusions. So we envisage uh, that the next prototype or the final version of this will will actually use the docking unit as uh, a structural member within the chassis so we won't need these tubes and we can really integrate them uh, the pods a lot better within the chassis and save a lot of weight and space. So the next step for the project uh, is validation. Uh, validation testing, we, we validated everything on a component and an individual level and now what we're going to do is further durability testing and functional testing uh, on a full system level. So the durability will include things like impact drop tests, mechanical docking tests, repeated dock tests, so we do thousands of cycle tests, more discharge and cycle tests, uh, over 300 for the battery life, and the electrical dock tests, and then environmental testing for the pods and docks, temperature cycles, humidity cycles, uh, vibration plates, and water ingress testing uh, also. And our local track, uh, we're going to hire that over the next few weeks, and we will we'll be doing some full range testing. So we get to ride the bike uh, uh, between 70, 80, 90 laps around this this little track. But it's got an off road section as well, so it's good. We can we can get some little off road jumps in there and really test start to test some durability and some functionality as well uh, on the track. And from this, what we'll do is then start from a clean sheet of paper again and develop the third and hopefully final pre-production motorcycle uh, which will be even more tightly compacted uh, based on all the information we've picked up so far and we'll look to commercialize this motorcycle and hopefully introduce it to the Lango motorcycle brand and I'm hoping in maybe six nine months uh, possibly a year I can come back and speak to you all and show you the the production version of the motorcycle uh, and the pods where they are at that time, possibly with different cell structure inside. And finally, I'd just like to say in, in, in the two years uh, I've been working uh, since founding Brace Technology and working in the EV sector, uh, it could not be possible at all without collaboration. And that, and that is the most important thing that we've learned. I mean, from the Niche Vehicle Network and Innovate UK, who have funded a lot of the R&D work that we've done so far, uh, through the Automotive Alliance, who've helped with supply chain and networks and project management, uh, and Senex, and then people like the DSTL, who are helping uh, direct us with, with the MOD, uh, the MCIA, for a great for market statistics, and of course, companies we work very closely with, such as Tirius and AJE Powertrain. Thank you very much, and you're welcome to ask any questions. Yep. So I'll just say um, thank you, Chris, for that uh, very interesting talk. Um, lots of uh, interesting technology development there from a small company, which is really encouraging to see. And um, you. you say there's a lot, lot, lot of good co collaboration there as well, which is nice to yeah. see as well. Um, we've got some questions already. That okay. Into the chat. So, um, and it's free. I, I didn't mention at the beginning, so apologies. That if you've got any questions from the, from our guests, then please feel free to add them to the chat, and I'll try and get through as many as we can in the next uh, in the next fifteen minutes. Um, so, just out of interest from my side, I just would like to understand from a low temperature application. Do, do you foresee any issues with um, with uh, lower ambient temperatures and performance? Uh, yes, I mean we're we're running simulations now, and it, again, you know this this goes down to cell chemistry, uh, and lithium ions. We we have the ability within the pod to uh, in a in a very low ambient temperature to preload the cells. So we we put a current through the cells at a slightly lower voltage, uh, and that in turn uh, warms them up, drops the resistance, and gives us more uh more capacity uh the for for running the bike when we're we're on higher load so we're looking at different scenarios for that at the moment yes but uh, there's still some work to be done in that area i think for for the industry not just <laughs> not just power pods hmm. um question from andrew fraser um can the motorcycle run with only two uh, a couple of pods in place i think you did uh, yeah well back. this yeah sorry i yeah. probably should be more clear here but yeah i mean uh, the whole philosophy is that the bike could run on one pod. Uh, the, you know, you, we can save 30 kilogram on the bike, which in an off-road scenario is absolutely critical. Even even commuting, you know, it's such a huge proportion of the overall vehicle weight. Uh, 
but then they, we have the ability to run more pods for a longer journey. So it depends on the use case, and this is the flexibility that we're giving. You know, it's it's also great for the manufacturers because they can sell a vehicle with one pod and essentially knock a few thousand pound off the the vehicle costs and get you know it's it's an accessible level of entry for people, uh, which they can then add to in the future. But you know, we also have the ability to connect the pods together if necessary uh, under a higher load scenario, uh, just to spread. Uh, the load and the, and the thermal capacity across the pods as well. Hmm. Um, there's another question from Andrew. It's interesting. Um, I reference a Spanish scooter company, Silence Scooters. Are you, are you familiar with those? Uh, they ring a bell. Uh, yeah, not sure. No, it's, it's, it was question. It, it suggested that there was a similar concept, but with the one larger, um, one larger battery by the look of it. Yeah. So you know, the, there are a lot of companies uh, in the scooter space at the moment that have. A swappable battery, so it's a it's a battery that is you know uh, ten kilograms or so that you can take out and and replace. I think what we have is something unique where we have actually standalone power supplies that are not tied to one vehicle, and we have this scenario where we can we have the cascading discharge where if one depletes, you can remove one, leave it out, and carry on riding, or top it up with another one. So we have this kind of topping up scenario, but also we have the ability to use the, the batteries as a as a separate power supply off the vehicle as well so you know this uh, this has also been looked at in sort of developing countries where we have to, where people have to track nurses and teachers and things like that have to track across uh, the rainforest and have some power supply when they get there and then have you know a number of days to charge the pod slowly in that scenario mm. i mean from from experience military application would uh, would would be good for a yes. single single supply of power effectively so a single source that would precisely be, yeah but you know yeah. as i mentioned we're in some good conversations at the moment and uh mm. was down was down at a motocross track uh just a week ago with uh, the mod yeah that's uh interesting yeah um another one um we've got um is the cooling passive passive in this pod design is cooling passive in this pod design yes that's right mean, so yeah. Yeah, so the torch rack, as we call it, uh, it's basically a, a, a an array of heat sinks between all all of the cell layers, uh, and we take those out to the cooling fins, which is also the carrying handle uh, at the end. So we've done a lot of testing with this, and we're, and we're getting around so far with the current design around ten percent decrease of full of, of temperature at full load, and the biggest benefit really is is the drop off uh, in temperature once once it comes to a standstill. So once you've stopped taking the load, we we, we take the heat out very quickly, we, which means you can load up the uh, the pod quicker, you know, uh, and you can fast charge the pod quicker uh, also. There's another specific question there. What is the maximum amps per cell draw in the simulation? Uh, I can't remember. I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah, it is in there. I can I can get back to uh, yeah, get back to that person. We've got some very in-depth reports. I, I didn't want to bore everybody with too much uh, <laughs> detail. Um, question, uh, what software are you using for the, sim for the simulation? Uh, GT Suite. Okay. Um, right, have you looked at the, on, on the impact on battery life of the approach of discharging one battery almost entirely, rather than sharing the discharge across all four? The question yeah, so, is yeah, that's a, deep uh, cycling. Yeah. Yeah, it's a good question. So the the cycling we're doing at the moment, uh, I mean, first of all, we're, we're we're only dropping to 20 percent state of charge, but we're all the calculations we're doing at the moment are based on one pod being depleted uh, and and cycled in that way. What we've not done yet is uh, a sort of a collection of pods together uh, and cycling them because you know the the greatest use case is each pod depleting. Uh, uh, in turn, so uh, and that is the worst case scenario. So that's what we're looking at at the moment. But you know, anything else above that will be will be a great improvement. Mm. Um, the question on the um, interesting one: Would it be technically feasible and possibly desirable both um, to have the docking panel central to the bike and shorter pods docked either side? Yeah, precisely. I mean, this this mule vehicle that 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 you see at the moment is a compromise. So we, you know, we we was on a funding program. The time was limited. We we decided to use 18650 cells and that that's where the limitations came in the early days where we to get the capacity from each pod that we wanted uh we we had to go with 
four layers which determined our length and determining the length meant that we you know given rider ergonomics and the knees we, we had to position them in a certain place so what we're doing now is looking at different cell uh, sort of structures and cell chemistries and we're looking at pouch cells and yeah I mean the, the intention is the next version of the bike uh, will hopefully be utilizing pouch cells and we will uh, It'll be a much more compact bike, uh, yeah, all, all, all around the central mass point of the vehicle. Yeah, so that's, uh, that's the, the very good point. It is, and it leads. There's, there's a there's a secondary bit to the question as well, and it, it's about the um, uh, potential damage if the bike is dropped to the to the cells. What's you know, what, I guess it's a case of what's the, the 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 least amount of damage you could do, and how you position parts. So if because yeah. obviously bikes yeah. do go over, and if you use it in an off road application, there's a good chance of that happening, isn't there? Exactly. Yeah, I mean, you know, there are two things there. One of them, the pod itself, where uh, we're going through a dur durability program now and impact testing. Uh, you know, we went through a phase of uh, uh, FEA at the beginning <clears throat> to uh, to design the housings. We have on the pod itself, we have an aluminium outer, which also acts as a guard on the exposed side. But then the docking unit uh, is the key to everything there. So it's they they are housed tightly inside. Uh, uh, an aluminium extrusion which will form part of the chassis in the future so there won't be a chassis the aluminium extrusions will be the chassis and the connect to uh to the sort of side members and then the headstock uh, again tightly compacted like uh, the question suggested and yeah they, they protect everything and you know we yes there will probably be some more work uh, over the coming months to further create i think uh, vibration is our biggest worry at the moment and you know we'll take this on off road tracks, uh, cobbled uh, parve and, and, and things like that, uh, and stick the pods on some vibration plates in house as well, you know, and, and really, you know, the, it, it might be that we create some isolation, so maybe isolation inside the pod as well, uh, as between the pod and on the dock unit. I think you're on mute, Mark. Sorry. Yeah. Um, I was trying to read the question. <laughs> there was a, it's been rephrased. Um, have the batteries uh, been designed considering the product life cycle, including sustainable sources, uh, sourcing the batteries and 100% recyclability of the motorcycle? Yes. Yes. So, uh, you know, this is uh, what our philosophy is in, in embrace at the moment is trying to find ways to uh, adopt sustainability in, in, into the EV sector. Now, <clears throat> one thing I didn't mention was the, the pods uh, are six, so the IP, IP67 rated, but they are sealed using a, a removable gasket, uh, removable liquid gasket system, so they can be serviced, uh, we can replace components in them, but more importantly, they can be disassembled uh, easily at the end of their life. Uh, you know, at, at the moment they're using some plastic casings for the pod themselves, but we're looking into uh, different materials there as well, uh, and different composite, natural composite materials as well. Uh, and in terms of the cells, again, we we're doing, you know, we're, we're looking closely at what the industry is doing, but at the moment we can only use what is what is available. So we're trying to make it uh, be able to disassemble into its component parts quite easily and to be serviceable as well. Yeah. Okay. Um, good question as well. Um... If uh, a rider would prefer extra range, or you're looking at extra carrying capacity, uh, for example, in a pannier design, or or any any other uh, space on the bike, I guess, to uh, carry extra batteries. Yeah, good question. Yeah, uh, yes, it's the short answer. I mean, we I can't say a lot about this because it's uh, uh, we're working on a project, uh, just embarking on the project with another company, uh, but. Uh, if we take power pods and power docks, I guess I can say we're looking at power panniers. Uh, <laughs> and that is, uh, yeah, that, that's very much something we're looking at at the moment. Very good. Um, quick question, what is the charging time for a pod? Uh, currently, we're working at around three hours for a pod uh, because we, you know, uh, our view is that a pod will, having a multiple array of pods means that the, the charging capacity Charging time is not necessarily important because it can be done overnight or whilst you're using other pods. So we, in doing that uh, and reducing the sort of charge speed, we 
we don't need to incorporate any liquid cooling so we keep the the packaging down the energy density and the cost down you know it's always something we want to charge faster we just need to include more features more size and more cost so it's, it's doable but the, the whole point of the power pods is that we don't need to do that because we have instant hot swappable capability mm. okay um question from my side uh, crash test uh, development work for, for legislative requirements is there any, anything mm -hmm. specific any challenges with that yeah well it's funny in the motorcycle world uh industry the there are actually less uh regulations to and standards that are in place at the moment uh in the in, in ev motorcycles so what we're doing is is looking at the the automotive in uh car sector and trying to match the the regulations and, and run through crash tests and simulations at the moment but then physical crash tests uh later down the line later this year hopefully so we're trying to be ahead of the game a little bit because generally the one cycle industry tends to follow in terms of regulations uh, a couple of years later yeah okay interesting okay um well looks like that's um the last of the questions there's no more in the in the chat room um and again i must say um really good lecture thank you very much chris that's thank you oh, for your thank time you. It's Thank really you. informative, um, and I say nice to see a, a, a you know a UK-based development that's that's ongoing, and it's got lo lots of uh, potential success ahead of it. Brilliant. Yeah, Thank great. You. Thank you. Yeah, well, hope to come back and uh, update yeah. you uh, in, in a year's time. <laughs> Don't worry, I'll chase you. Don't worry. <laughs> All right. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Yes. Thank you for everyone for attending as well. Appreciate it. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Bye.